Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you to PKP for inviting me. Um, it's a real honor um, and happy to be in Montreal. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a, a, a kind of shift in gears and talk to you about um, a project that I'm working on with PKP um, and the Open Access Cooperative Study, and particularly testing a model for the flipping of subscription journals um, that we are calling a subscription equivalent transition. Um, so that is me. Um, I'm, as James mentioned, a, a doctoral candidate at Stanford. Uh, John Walensky is my wonderful advisor. Um, I also work for a publisher um, and a subscription publisher at that. Um, I am the director of partnerships and initiatives for a nonprofit publisher called Annual Reviews. Um, and that is relevant, um, and I will tell you about that in a moment. Um, so I do two full-time things, and um, if you're wondering why I look a lot older and tired than that picture, uh, that's, that's what two years of doing two full-time gigs will do to you. Um, so, uh, um, so this is the study. Um, this presentation is going to be available to all of you, I hope, and uh, there's there, there's lots of live links in there for you to use. Um, but part of the um, study that we're working on with PKP is to look at um, exploring sustainable paths for transitions of journals to open access. Um, for many of you, or for any of you that may be familiar with um, some of the major OA flipping work that's going on, um, a lot of it being led in Europe, um, some by the OA 2020 group um, from the Max Planck Institute, a lot of it is focused very much on the sciences, on primary research, and is using the APC as the essential basic unit for the flipping of, of journals. Um, as John mentioned in his talk yesterday, um, we believe that there are, uh, well, that the APC model isn't really the right model to be pursuing because it only focuses on a certain set of the literature. Um, also, it only benefits a certain set of countries. Um, so we're looking at um, exploring paths for alternate kinds of literature, um, paths that may be more suitable for the humanities and social sciences, um, but also maybe paths that um, are for, for uh, research outputs that are not primary research. So um, what we, an idea that um, John had advanced um, is this idea of um, the subscription equivalent transition and um, so it's an alternative model for the transition of OA, which does not work on an APC. Um, it's inspired by the scope three knowledge on latch and open, open library of the humanities initiatives for those of you who are familiar with that. The basic idea is, is that we have an existing economy um, for subscriptions, which um, may not be ideal, but there are transactional relationships in place between libraries and publishers. And why don't we use that as a starting point for transition to open access? So um, in this kind of uh, model, um, for those of you who know scope three will know it, it in effect works this way, um, we're asking libraries to think of redirecting subscription funds <clears throat> towards supporting OA publishing of journals. So in this way, it is uh, revenue neutral for publishers. They continue to get the same money, um, and it's expense neutral for libraries. Um, we ask for three-year commitment, and um, if the economics of a transition for a sustainable open access um, setup didn't work, there was always the option for publishers to revert back to the original subscription model. Um, we initially tested this with um, li libraries through a library survey. Um, there were about uh, you know, 256 participants from 220 institutions. Uh, most of the response was from U.S. and Canadian libraries, um, although we did get a spread for some other countries. Um, so uh, this, there's isn't really a whole lot of very useful information here other than um, the blue meaning that people agreed or somewhat agreed with our approach. Um, so libraries did see this as a um, kind of useful model to at least explore. 95% um, of them thought that uh, this was something that they should look into. So wearing my hat um, at annual reviews, I thought, okay, well, why don't I put my money where my mouth is and see if I can get us to transition one of our journals um, to open. And so um, and this is going to sound a little bit of a kind of marketing speak for the um, for the publisher, but I think it's useful for you to know about our publishing model um, and how 
how that has essentially helped play into this. Um, we're a nonprofit publisher, um, and when I say we're a nonprofit, we're not like some of the societies that are nonprofit and have business models that are um, a little uh, more like commercial publishers. Um, we're very much a nonprofit publisher. Um, we have. We don't have a society to uh, finance. Um, we don't have shareholders to satisfy. Um, for the last few years, we've actually made less money than we've spent on our journals. We're working to correct that. Um, the company is old. Um, so is everyone on the board, um, <laughs> which is problematic in its own right. And I'll talk, talk to that in a moment. Um, it was established in 1932. Um, I think the only way you can exit the board is by dying. Uh, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, we just lost the board member, sadly. Um, but <laughs> but uh, not funny. Um, uh, so we have 50 journals in the biomedical, physical, and social sciences. We consider ourselves small but mighty. We have the same number of number one ranked journals as uh, Springer Nature does, um, being, a very, have, you know, being a, only a very small company. Um, but increased visibility of our content is an important organizational goal, so um, we really do believe that um, there's tremendous value to our content being open. Um, but sadly, there have been no prevailing models that exist for transition of review articles, kind of like we published, to, to be made open. So we thought with this um, kind of merging of um, research work being done at the Open Access Cooperative Project that we would uh, see if we could transition at least one of our journals to open. Um, we started this year with the Annual Review of Public Health. Um, and it is a journal that's been published annually since 1980. Um, it has an impact factor of 10.29, for those of you who care about that kind of stuff. It's ranked second in the category um, in the JCR, um, second only to uh, Lancet Global Health, um, which is an open access publication. So um, that was another you know, kind of motivating factor for us to see um, what would the impact of making this journal open be on citation rates. Um, so it's a, it's a great and important journal. Um, it being public health also meant that, uh, you know, it was a much easier case for us to make, to make this journal open to our board, um, who didn't necessarily see a, open access as being a viable business model for our company, um, but also that, you know, we publish stuff that really is relevant to people all over the world, particularly in this journal. Um, so just a little bit um, about the economics of the journal. Um, so our company is a $15 million company. We publish 50 journals, 15 divided by 50, about $300,000 it costs to publish a volume um, for one of our journals. Um, we have 11,000 online journal subscribers, um, 878 that subscribe through a collection, which means that they're, they're buying kind of a, a bundle of journals, um, about 120 that have a custom collection of journals, so they, they select, you know, uh, just their own kind of customized collection, and just under 100 that subscribe to the journal and just that journal. Um, the subscription cost of one of our journals, um, or at least for the Annual Review of Public Health, is $244, $254. I say approximate because for some people who purchase through a collection, they may get a 10% discount, so some may be paying a little bit less. We have a handful of corporate customers, maybe a five or six, who pay a little bit more. Um, but on average, it's about $250. Um, as a um, you know, small company with a very small sales force, we've primarily only really had an academic audience, so we've only really reached out to universities around the world. We have um, pretty good penetration, though, amongst all the major universities, so you know, we have uh, customers at all the major institutions around the world. We were given funding support by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for this effort. Um, and through their initiative on increasing transparency and openness in research. The project had two objectives, um, which was to examine the impact of open access on the journal and to develop and test a sustainable uh, collective open access model. Um, we received funding in April 2017. We delayed um, publication of the volume, which usually publishes in March, to when we actually received the funding and then published volume 38, open access, and then 
all 37 previous volumes are, I guess, now bronze, um, but, you know, on the website, freely available, but we didn't go to the effort of relicensing everything because that would have taken forever and been a nightmare. Uh, but this is uh, the, the journal now. It's open access. Um, it's linked on the presentation, so you can go to it from there. This is one of the articles marked OA, uh, CC BY share alike license um, for one of the articles. Um, I don't know, this doesn't really show very well, but the very first article is an annual reviews article. I think it's from uh, microbiology. So if you're, if you're not on a campus and you search for annual reviews, you find one of our articles, that's what it's going to look like. It's going to take you to a, a paywall site. Um, for others, it may show a, a PDF to something that, uh, to a version um, which is likely uh, submitted manuscript version at a, uh, like an institutional repository, possibly through ResearchGate or Academia.edu. Um, for the annual review of public health now, uh, even if you're not on campus, you get the exact same experience that you would if you were on campus, and on the right you'll see the link html.annualreviews.org. Um, so it's a, it's a subtle change um, for the user experience through Google Scholar, um, but uh, an impactful one. Um, so, as I said, objective one of the project was testing the impact. Um, this is only, I only have three months of usage data, um, but this is just to show you what it looks like. So the black line um, is showing you 2017. I don't know how visible this is all the way from the back, but um, that is, uh, the spike that you're seeing is the moment from when um, the volume was published open access. This red line at the bottom, which kind of ends at um, March, um, was our denial data. So those were people that were trying to get to the journal and trying to access an article but were turned away by the paywall. Um, so it's nice to see that go away. And if you think of attempts prior to March at accessing the volume as being the successful attempts, which were about 30,000 plus the denials, which was about 35,000, we ended up in the first month hitting 70,000. So um, it, it indicated that we weren't only reaching potentially the initial audience of people that has successfully and then unsuccessfully tried to get to the article, but we are reaching a whole new audience um, by making the, the content open. Um, now, as much as that decline looks a little discouraging, um, this is comparing to the same period last year. Um, we usually go through a summer slump in usage. Um, what this is showing you is in April, we had 126% increase in usage. In May, it was 100%. Um, and in June, almost 180% increase in usage over previous years. So I can go to my board and say, hey, you know, open access is good. We should be doing more of this. Um, I had to take Iran out of this table because their percentage increase was so high. It was making, it was basically dwarfing all of these. They had a 3,800% increase in usage um, in the last three months, and um, I'm not sure what that's attributable to. But possibly, I don't know, they, I believe there's Sci-Hub mirror sites in Iran, so maybe there were some, uh, some bots downloading. Um, but, you know, for France, Japan, India, Russia, Germany, um, everyone had an increase of over 200%. Um, in the UK and USA, the increases are a little more modest, but um, still, you know, 25-30% increases. I guess in that case, we're, it might suggest that, um, you know, through our subscription business, we had already reached much of that audience, so we weren't seeing as much of an increase. Um, France, we don't have a lot of customers, so um, it was nice to see this, um, this big increase in France. Um, and just as a sample, for Sub-Saharan Africa, we saw some huge increases in usage from the journal as well, like really important and uh, encouraging to see that, um, particularly for a public health journal. So um, next up, uh, as we're pretty early on in this project, we're gonna be mapping usage and citation over a long period of time, um, tracking altmetrics of the articles. Uh, I'm gonna be working hopefully with Juan to uh, do some serving of readers for demographic info. Um, we've started syndicating content to other platforms to try and get uh, awareness of this stuff in front of the public health practitioner community. Um, this is one that actually appeared today um, on the AS uh, Association of Schools of Public Health Programs um, Friday letter. Um, one of the articles is being highlighted there. 
Um, so next, talking about testing the, subs the subscription equivalent transition model. Um, so this is where we ask institutions to redirect their subscription spend towards supporting OA publication costs. Um, because we received funding in April, um, we had actually already invoiced everyone in January for 2017, but then we received funding um, to uh, essentially make the volume open. So institutions had already, already paid for 2017. So we had to go back um, to our institutions and ask them um, if they would be willing to contribute their 2017 spend, so what they'd already spent on the journal, towards keeping the 2018 volume open. Um, if they didn't, they could ask for a refund or a credit, um, so we're in the process of doing that. Um, and if there's a shortfall, we will seek alternative funding sources. So we're in the very initial stages, um, we have contacted only consortium customers, of which there are 600. We've heard from 35 of them. I was, a <laughs> I was able to add 11 to the contributions this morning because the consortium in the Netherlands agreed, um, so it was not looking as good as it was. Um, if we don't hear response, we must refund the money to the customers. Um, we'll be doing a couple more rounds of solicitation from libraries for contributions. Um, a couple of lessons are that timing is critical, so um, this whole thing about receiving the, the funds after we had invoiced libraries ha has proven to be really problematic. Um, we need ways to demonstrate early impact, so we're tracking usage. I'm trying to think of um, more engaging, maybe even, even interactive ways for people to see how usage is changing um, and across the world. Um, it's, it's complex work, working with consortia and also with agents. Um, everyone has a different way of doing business. and. That's been somewhat tricky to navigate. Um, we've also encountered the, the problem of some people interpreting um, the language of the email in which we've solicited their contributions to the collective fund. They're thinking of it as a donation. Um, and uh, in some areas, like in Georgia, states prohibit the use of library funds for donations. And so um, that is something that we're going to try and get around. Um, an alternative approach. Um, would have been to use the funding to manage free ridership, so um, to push the funding to a future year to, uh, to try and build the collective for, um, for the next volume, and then if there was any free ridership, um, to then use the funding to buffer that. Um, but we had put it in the proposal, so that's what we had to do. Um, <laughs> uh, the collective offer for us also needs to be bigger, so we're working to model um, uh, and uh, build new collective off offerings. We're working with Rain Crow. Um, we're going to work with libraries in the process of doing this, um, and we're going to try and frame it to circumvent this donation restriction. Um, how can you help? I'm going to ask um, for librarians in the room to be an advocate. Um, speak to your collections librarians of these kinds of approaches. Let them know what you think. Um, if you'd like to uh, tweet about this project, uh, use the hashtag OpenPublicHealth and. Thank you very much.